In 1996, a series of advertisements ran in various gaming magazines for the upcoming Quake from id Software. They're humorously misleading, idealistic imagery stamped with the iconic Q logo, conveniently forgetting to show anything of the game itself, which was, in the id tradition, fast, violent, and boundary-pushing. At the bottom of these ads is an interesting little tagline for something not yet released. The most important PC game ever. It might sound pompous, but whoever was in charge of marketing at the time might as well have had a crystal ball. Just like Doom before it, Quake would change the world. When Doom released in 1993, it was the cutting edge of graphics. Many would describe it as 3D, but this was basically impossible at the time. Doom ran in two dimensions, but used a handful of clever techniques to render only what the player was looking at as 3D. This was done to save on processing power, as neither graphics cards nor onboard graphics were powerful enough to render a fully three-dimensional environment. This is John Carmack, lead programmer and one half of the famous Two Johns of id Software. If you like PC gaming history, say hi, you'll be seeing him a lot. John Carmack is in the business of being a freak genius who happened to dedicate the first third of his life to doubling the advancement of computer graphics. Carmack is the Ryu of programming. He basically looks at every new project as a way to improve his coding abilities rather than make profit. Thus, following the revolutionary visuals of Wolfenstein 3D and Doom, he and the rest of the team set their sights on the legendary Full 3D. Not only would Quake's graphics be stunning for their time, it would mark a watershed moment for the market. Up to this point, graphics card manufacturers like NVIDIA and 3DFX were pumping money into developing more powerful units, but they ran into a problem. There's no software that actually needed that amount of power. Until Quake, of course. The game's initial release was too demanding for much of the hardware at the time. The cards couldn't handle all of the load, so a considerable amount of work went to the processors. Even then, it required CPUs that were a tier above almost any other game. It was clear that these were growing pains, and so id started development on GL Quake, a version of the game optimized for the 3D accelerator cards on the horizon. Quake was the GPU seller, the crisis of the day, and GL Quake's specific approach to using the hardware shaped the way graphics drivers would be coded in the future. It's really no exaggeration to say that John Carmack invented 3D graphics on computers. In fact, the original code he created for rendering full 3D environments, lighting, and animation is so rock solid that it can still be found in games today. If you pick up a copy of Call of Duty, Fortnite, Minecraft, Skyrim, chances are high that they're still using bits and pieces of Quake. The explosion of Quake would bring with it much of the culture that Doom had nurtured. Multiplayer was one such staple. Doom had some of the tightest, fastest gameplay that emphasized aim and momentum, so it's no surprise that it grew a dedicated deathmatch scene. Fun fact, the term deathmatch itself comes from Doom, coined by John Romero. Quake introduced an even greater mechanical depth with its embrace of 3D paving the way for advanced movement techniques like rocket jumping and bunny hopping. One thing was holding back the competitive scene, however, latency. If users weren't playing over a direct LAN connection, they'd have to do so using dial-up internet. To make things slightly easier, fans would host dedicated servers, but even this was cumbersome. Connecting to a server meant digging through Usenet, bulletin board services, and the fledgling World Wide Web, 
finding an address, hoping to god it worked, writing it down, and then manually putting it into the game. A few coders by the names of Joe Q. Spy Powell, Jack Morbid Matthews, and Tim Cook would develop Quake Spy, an application to search and index Quake servers across the world. At around the same time, another duo of programmers, John Cash and Christian Antcow, would pitch Carmack an updated version of Quakes Online. The netcode for Quake wasn't built for play over any significant distances, mostly for LAN connections. The same year as the game's launch, Duke Nukem 3D would also premiere with a new solution for just this problem, client-side prediction. Basically, when you play a game connected to other players by a server, everyone sends their inputs to the server, and then it spits the results back out. However, if your connection is slow or unstable, you fall out of sync with the other players. If you hit the W key to move forward, the game goes, whoa, hold up. I need to check with the server that you just did that. And then the server says, uh-huh, yeah, they just did that. Your game breathes a sigh of relief, your character takes one step forward, and then you're crushed into oblivion by a rocket you couldn't escape in time. Using client-side prediction, when your connection is worse, you hit the forward key and your game says, yeah, I know what moving forward is, and you see your character move forward without any delay. In most cases, these lag spikes are small enough that by the time the server verifies what you did, everyone else sees you doing what you were doing on your own screen anyway. This elegant approach to netcode would change the way that games were played online, making them much more accessible to the rapidly growing number of people on the internet. An updated version of Quake, titled Quake World, would be released for free shortly after the initial game, and come bundled with Quake Spy. With this, players could easily search for active communities with good connections to them and play a relatively seamless online experience. Competitive Quake was one of the first real forces in PC esports, with officially sanctioned tournaments as well as countless homegrown scenes. This accessibility fostered a community that began to break up into their own niches. The growing competition meant that teams had to be formed, and with Quake, some of the first clans were created. Groups had been popping up in various online games before this, but Quake World was the dawn of competitive teams. The fandom of the player base hadn't been seen before, and people were starting to express their passion in many ways. Doom pioneered a new method of sharing gameplay footage. Recording footage into a video file was storage intensive and a pain to upload and download online. The workaround was quite simple. Everything that happened in a playthrough of a level, down to frame by frame positions and inputs, could be recorded and saved as a lightweight demo file. That file could then be shared much more easily over the net, and another player could simply load it into their own copy of Doom, and it would recreate exactly what had happened. This became an invaluable resource for growing one of the earliest speedrunning communities. See, Doom was built for speed. John Romero, the other of the two Johns, was highly competitive. Remember that he is the origin of Deathmatch. As such, he'd made sure that every id game, starting with Wolf 3D, recorded the player's time at the end of a level. He was so obsessed with completing them as fast as possible that he earned the nickname The Surgeon for the way that he picked them apart so thoroughly. Quake was no different, but with the aforementioned freedom of movement, there were even more ways to break the limits of speed. Because the game used the same demo method that Doom did, players were able to share their runs of the game and individual levels, studying each other's techniques to get the best times. This budding scene resulted in the first collaborative speedrunning event, 1997's Quake Done Quick. Whereas most speedruns were either individual levels or the entire game by one person, Quake Done Quick was more of a relay race. Three players, Jonathan Donner, Matthias Bells, and Nolan Flug, split the game into sections that each of them would try to complete as fast as possible. At the end, their lowest times would be added up to the final record. 
The runs were then condensed into a single demo that was then additionally refilmed from a third-person perspective to give it a filmic presentation. Because of the demo format, you can still download the original run and play it in your copy of Quake to see it exactly as it was done 20 years ago. There is no shortage of people who claim that Quake Done Quick and its many successors got them into speedrunning. A year later, the Speed Demos archive would be founded. At first, it was just a collation of demos from both Flug and another player called Muad Dib. It would expand to be the original home of the speedrunning community, hosting a wide variety of games and setting standards for categorization and verification still used by the community. Today, speedrunning is bigger than ever and continues to grow with the popularity of live streaming, charity events like Games Done Quick, I wonder where they got that name from, and in-person races for prize pools in the thousands. This wouldn't be the only use of demos, however, as other players sought a more creative outlet to show their love for the game. The demo system proved very flexible when taken from multiplayer deathmatches. Because it's just a reconstruction of events, the entire match can be viewed from the perspective of any player, as well as a disembodied spectator. Uploaders of demo files wanted to flex their skills over others and make it look as good as possible. Thus, the best deathmatch demos started to take on the same directorial flair as Quake Done Quick. In 1996, members of the Quake Clan Rangers formed a subdivision called United Ranger Films. Their first creation was a demo file entitled Diary of a Camper. Unlike any other demos at the time, this one wasn't just a showcase of gameplay, but an attempt to tell a story, albeit brief. One player acting as cameraman is in spectator mode, and dialogue is presented through the in-game chat. A group of players are scouting an area when two go through a portal to check the room above them. Lying in wait is the titular camper, ready to surprise them. After realizing what's happened, the group launch a barrage of rockets into the room, later discovering that the camper was none other than John Romero. Nothing you couldn't tell in a Sunday comic, but I have to be impressed with how competent it is from a filmmaking perspective. Everything is framed well, and I like how you can infer who's talking just by their emotions and the stances of the other characters. It's also interesting that it references more meta ideas, like a camper as part of the story. You can think of it as a precursor to the video game based humor that would become common online in web comics and early YouTube. This new brand of filmmaking, using players as actors and in-game maps as sets, would be called Quake Movies at first. However, when these expanded to include films made in other games, a new term would be adopted, machinima, a portmanteau of machine and cinema. Still in the realm of Quake, several fan-made tools would be developed to make recording and editing demo files easier for more elaborate productions. It was with these that entire feature-length machinimas were created, such as the Seal of Nahara, which clocked in at a whopping four hours. Machinima.com was founded in 2000 as a repository for its namesake, but quickly grew to host news, interviews, guides, and articles. It was throughout the 2000s and early 2010s that well-known series like Red vs. Blue and Arby and the Chief would gain popularity. Many will be more familiar with the YouTube channel that became part of its main brand, at least before the company was cannibalized from the inside by management. Rest in peace, old friend. In recent years, the traditional idea of machinima has largely fallen away, as sites like YouTube have trended towards consistent, longer-form content that isn't as possible with the medium. It's not all doom and gloom, though, as plenty of people still practice making machinima as hobbies, often paired with outside editing. Tools like Source Filmmaker allow for an even greater level of control over the direction of game assets and has been used for years to make animations. Just like the days of old, these range from comedic to dramatic to... Uh, let's move on to the last section. Hey, 
Hey, speaking of SFM, throughout the 80s and 90s, two programmers by the names of Gabe Newell and Mark Harrington worked at Microsoft, overseeing the development of the first three versions of Windows. Newell was a big believer in gaming as a selling point for PCs, and especially new operating systems. Their biggest competitor, Apple, had lost many game devs during the DOS era when they switched to their own proprietary language, AppleSoft Basic. Programmers already preferred DOS and the other IBM compatibles because it was easier to port their games from one system to another. But Microsoft themselves hadn't leaned into this market yet, preferring to focus on business software. In 1994, Doom was on more PCs than Windows, and Newell contacted Carmack, offering to port it to the OS for free. WinDoom and its later Doom 95 version would cement Windows as the gaming computer. While working with Newell and Harrington, Carmack said something along the lines of, Hey, you guys are really good. You should make a game studio. Around this time, another programmer named Michael Abrash left Microsoft to work at id on Quake. Inspired by these two occurrences, Newell and Harrington split from Microsoft and created Valve, and as a favor, reached out to Carmack to ask if they could license the engine to Quake 2. One thing you have to know about John Carmack is that this man loves giving out source code, so he was happy to oblige. With a little modification, id Tech 2 would be renamed to Valve's own Gold Source Engine, and with it, they'd publish their first game. A little title you may have heard of called Half-Life. There are many things in this video that I could devote entire separate videos to, but I want to draw attention to Half-Life because when it released in 1998, it revolutionized both first-person shooters and storytelling in games. An FPS starring a scientist named Gordon Freeman who was having the worst day ever, Half-Life challenged players to approach situations with logic and strategy over twitch reactions and advanced movement. It told a blockbuster story from beginning to end without ever taking control away from the player. It's hard to understand just how different this was at the time, but a game's story had never been presented like this before, in a way that really made you feel like you were in the main character's shoes. You can see its influence in tiny ways everywhere in games today, from cinematic first-person sequences to subtle exchanges with NPCs, even the idea of items being left in sensible places around the world and not just floating mid-air. Half-Life not only changed gaming forever, it launched Valve to immediate rockstar success and paved the way for some of the best games ever made. One of those was Team Fortress 2. Where's Team Fortress 1? Uh, well, that wasn't a standalone game. It was a custom, fan-made game mode for Quake. Oh, and that success would also lead to Steam, the dominant online marketplace for games on PC, where you can now purchase and play the newly remastered Quake. Funny how history kind of wraps around. I said Quake 32 times in this video. Or I guess now make that 33. Do you have any memories of the game or are you just playing it now that it's been remastered? Have you even played it at all? Uh, let me know in the comments below and be sure to check it out on every platform that it's releasing on. Uh, it's seriously one of the most important PC games of all time and the remaster is just brilliant. It comes with all the official expansions and during this video you've seen me playing Scourge of Armagon, which always sounds to me like an Iron Maiden album and honestly it's probably better than anything <laughs> in the original Quake campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. Go play Quake. Bye.